Good afternoon, everyone. I am glad to be here. And today I kind of want to give a uh, preliminary layout for my planned dissertation work uh, at William & Mary. To foreground this, I will say this is a very preliminary project, and I just want to introduce a few uh, topics that are going to be relevant throughout this project uh, in my presentation. So the, the first thing is uh, shell beads. Why, why are they important? What are they? What are they? Um, and they're largely used as items of adornment uh, throughout prehistory, as well as during uh, European colonization by Native American groups, as well as other indigenous uh, communities and peoples throughout the world. And why they're of particular interest to me uh, is in archaeology and his, uh, historic populations. They are often involved in exchange uh, relationships. Uh, people are trading them. They um, they're they're producing them and then trading them with other communities and peoples for a variety of reasons. They can have implications for political relationships. They can be used to create social alliances. Um, and they they serve a lot of social purposes. They're also commonly used in rituals and in burial practices. Now, I will say uh, I've mentioned burials. I will not be showing any images of burials or materials from burial context, uh, just out of sensitivity to the communities that are associated with these uh, objects. A few other ideas that I want to uh, put forward really quickly uh, are an idea of paleoclimate and climate change. Now, the time period that I'm going to be looking at is referred to as the late woodland period, which is occurring between the years of AD 1000 or AD 900 and AD 1600. So this is the centuries right before Europeans show up in North America. And in the area of Virginia, throughout the Southeast, uh, and essentially across the entire uh, continent east of the Mississippi, Mississippi River, there's a lot of climate change happening. Temperatures are fluctuating, uh, droughts are occurring, and these have a lot of impacts on native communities that are living here during the time. Uh, and so I have some suspicions in my uh, early hypotheses. Uh, I believe that this sh the exchange of shell beads during this time period are likely tied to, in some way, uh, responses to climate change. Another idea that I want to put forward is that uh, an idea of frontiers. Now, in, ar in archaeological research uh, and anthropology as a whole, a frontier is a place where people of two different worlds, per se, are interacting. These are areas where um, two systems are butting up against each other, two or more systems are butting up against each other, and um, people are having to negotiate new environments, uh, social environments. And so I, in the Southern Virginia Piedmont, which is where I'm going to focus, and I'll show some uh, images of that in here, here shortly, I believe that there's interaction occurring to with populations to the West and the, in the South, possibly some uh, relationships that would fall in this category to the north, but I'm I'm envisioning this region as a prehistoric frontier. So to give a little bit of background on the area, I am looking at the Southern Virginia Piedmont, particularly the Roanoke River Basin, which takes up the vast majority of the Southern Piedmont. This area archeologically was heavily surveyed in the 1960s and 70s with a little bit of earlier work happening in the post-World War II era uh, of the late 40s and uh, early 50s. Much of this work was done by two prominent archaeologists, Howard McCord and Richard Gravely, and they led projects throughout the Roanoke River Basin identifying sites and trying to understand the pre-European uh, world that was existing in the uh, southern Piedmont. There were, there were a lot of intensive surveys, particularly around the area of Martinsville, as well as the area of uh, Bugs Island Lake or Kerr Reservoir. And so there's, there's a lot of interesting archaeology in this area, and a lot of these sites tended to yield these shell beads that I'm interested in. So a few sites that I'm particularly interested in uh, are the or sites clustered around the Martinsville area. There's also a site near... Uh, Bugs Island Lake, which is Kerr Reservoir. These sites tend to be palisaded, this meaning that they have a wooden wall erected around them. And there's a lot of different reasons why this may have been done, particularly uh, as a response to violence. And I think 
that is particularly relevant for why people might be exchanging uh, shell beads or other items that have social implications or are being used to create alliances. I think there's some reasons for reasons connected to violence and uh, conflict amongst groups that these shell beads might be tying into. So a lot of the sites that I look at will actually be palisaded settlements or settlements that show uh, that they were likely palisaded. Other sites include uh, one such site, uh, the Wade site near Randolph, Virginia. And this is a non-palisaded site, but there's some very interesting things happening at this site and other sites that are similar to it throughout the region. And so my goal is to find, is to identify sites that have shell beads and are connected throughout this river drainage um, as indicated on the map here. The map you're seeing here is John Smith's map of 1812, uh, or sorry, 1612, in which he depicts the locations of villages and great houses uh, throughout the Chesapeake area in what is now Virginia. Now, this is a very weird map in which uh, up on this map is actually west. Um, that's how John Smith drew it. And he recorded a lot of the information that we currently know about the peoples that were here in 1607 when Europeans arrived. Now, this provides some of our historic context for the peoples that were here. We also have some evidence from John Letterer, who was an explorer in the later 1600s, who recorded groups more located in the area that I'm interested in. And so the, there's a lot of historic evidence that there were, a, there were a number of different populations here, a number of different peoples, and dozens, if not hundreds, of villages throughout the region. Some of these tribes are the Saponis, the Okanishis, the Toteros, the Tuscarora, a lot of which have descendant communities that are alive today. Depicted here is a, um, a historic member of the Saponi tribe. And these different communities spoke a number of different languages. The languages can give us some idea of uh, the interactions that are people of people in the area, but it also can show us a, a little bit of boundaries between communities. Another way of trying to identify cultural traditions is using ceramic typologies. Typology, just a fancy way of us categor categorizing uh, pottery types in the area. And in archaeology, we use these a lot of times to try to identify cultural traditions. They give us an idea of the boundaries between people or the relationships between people. And so what history and archaeology has shown is there's a really complex situation that isn't entirely understood in this region of the peoples that were there, who are the ancestors of modern communities, whose relationships and identities that we only um, somewhat understand. Moving a little bit on from the uh, more regional background, I want to move into some of the methodologies that I want to use in this project. So one of the one of the things which is really fundamental to what I want to do is a lot of radiocarbon dating. Um, I, one aspect of the archaeology in Southern Virginia is that sites are not well dated. We don't have great chronologies for when these sites were occupied. A lot of our understanding of when these sites existed uh, or, or lived in comes from the ceramics that have been dated in other areas. Now, to understand exchange and how people are interacting, I, I've come to the conclusion that I have to do a lot of radiocarbon dating. Um, and one, one really interesting tool that's come up recently with radiocarbon dating is what's called Bayesian chronological modeling. This is um, a statistical approach to take radiocarbon dates and um, average them to develop a model of when of different events. And so the, the two events that I'm really interested in are when a site was first occupied and when a site was abandoned. That, to, that can tell me the windows, that, that can de demonstrate for me the windows and time that people could have been interacting and, and to, to make any arguments about exchange and to connect different populations, I need to have a grasp over um, this type of model. A lot of dates are necessary to do this. So one really cool thing about Bayesian modeling is I can actually do simulations and show via simulation, how many dates do I need to take at a particular site in order to get a certain level of precision that I want. So 
in an ideal world, I'd know the exact year a site was first occupied and the exact year that it ended. It's not exactly possible in radiocarbon dating. So instead, I've decided that I think having a 50 year window at the beginning and end of a site, I can be useful enough for me to do what I want to do. And the in running simulations can uh, tell me how many dates I need to achieve that. The next aspect of my project is what's called uh, laser ablation. It's really a bulky word, laser ablation, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. I'm just going to say laser ablation. I think that's uh, less of a mouthful for me. Uh, this is a destructive technique, though it's very minimally destructive. And so what laser ablation does is it cuts or ablates very small lines or pieces of whatever material that you're looking at. Um, and this is very useful for trying to analyze the elemental composition, the chemistry of an object, an item. Archaeologists have, uh, in the past probably decade or 20 years, have really started to use this technique for a variety of different reasons, because um, chemistry can uh, give us the opportunity to connect materials to locations. One aspect of the materials that we find archaeologically is we can't always confirm just by looking at something that it came from the place that we found it in. And in a lot of instances, uh, the fact is that it didn't come from that location. So what la laser ablation is one tool that's particularly helpful for um, identifying these locations that materials came from. And so this becomes pr uh, relevant for my project in that I want to do this type of work on shells. So shell beads are being made from shells along uh, the coastlines. And so the laser ablation gives the, gives the ability for me to um, uh, get the elemental chemistry of these objects, these, these shell uh, artifacts. And so through the, with the equipment, what it does is it takes off a piece and it, anal it dissolves that piece and analyzes it and can give me the elemental breakdown and percentages for that uh, piece of the shell. Now, this is this gets a little tricky when it comes to shell, and that there's a lot of differences in the way that sh uh, the way that em elemental chemistry for shells works, both across space and time. And this is uh, the biggest difference is when you're looking at freshwater shell versus uh, marine or estuarine shell. So, marine shell and it's, uh, shells that are uh, being created by mollusks in the oceans or in other saltwater sources is very uniform across space. There's, it's very hard to get any degree of precision of where something came from or where a certain uh, chemistry is located because it, there aren't really those differences across space. There, the only differences in ocean water is across time. Now, the reason for that is because temperatures and salinity are things, aspects that affects the chemistry. And while there aren't major changes in a big, in a, uh, like a, the Atlantic Ocean across space, those changes fluctuate th uh, throughout time. Now that gets hard for, uh, that, that becomes a really big problem for someone like me who's trying to date marine shell, but I'll get to that shortly. Now the chemistry itself, the way this works and the way that shell is taking chemistry is uh, what's called upwelling, where as these shells are formed, they are bringing in elements from the water that's surrounding uh, the shell and, and the mollusk that's creating the shell. And so uh, whatever elements, whatever chemistry, uh, whatever the water chemistry is, that is going to be what the resulting shell is going to be comprised of, um, at least in terms of percentages of different elements. Now, the chemistry of water is largely determined by the geologic regions that the water passes through. So now this gets particularly relevant for uh, where fresh water comes in because different rivers and, uh, are, and creeks and streams are gonna be passing through different geologies, different uh, rock formations, different types of minerals. And these differences will make uh, major differences in the chemistry of, uh, of the freshwater shells. And so, the finding the balance here is a little bit of where my work comes in, as well as the work that uh, I'm that has served as the foundation for mine. I had I have to give credit to uh, Chris Shepard, who is a who earned his PhD at uh, William and Mary, 
as well as uh, an archaeologist by the name of Evan Peacock, who works in the Mississippi area. They've done a lot of the foundational work on which I am basing my project and my methodologies for. And it's through their work that I'm understanding a lot of uh, how sh shell chemistry works and how the archaeology of trying to um, source this, this chemistry works. Shell sourcing wasn't really widespread throughout North American archaeology until probably the past decade, maybe 20 years. Using laser ablation on shells was, I think, from the early, earliest iterations of these sourcing projects seen as probably one of the best uh, paths forward. Different techniques have had, I've seen variable success. Even laser ablation has seen variable success. For instance, there's been problems in trying to do uh, similar work as to what I'm going to be proposing in California doesn't work the same way. You've got different uh, geologic formations, different types of water relationships there. Um, so this, it becomes very difficult. But what Chris Shepard uh, showed and on which I'm building off of is that the Chesapeake region provides a very unique environment for this type of work. Part of this is because of the relationship between freshwater and saltwater in the, in the Chesapeake area. In particular, the Chesapeake, one big estuarine uh, area where freshwater and saltwater are uh, interacting all the time. You've got very large river mouths throughout Virginia and North Carolina, where some of this work is going to be taking place. In these river mouths, in these uh, estuaries where there's freshwater influence, Chris Shepard showed, and uh, kind of what I'm, I'm banking a lot of my research on is that the, despite the fact that these organisms were living and thriving in areas that were dependent on saltwater, they were their, the chemistry of their shells was largely affected by uh, fresh water. Uh, and those differences we can, we can detect using laser ablation. And so that's where a lot of my uh, work is going to be building off of. Now, another aspect of the, the methods that I wanna get into here, this is kind of a, a, what I think is a very robust project is looking at uh, GIS or geographic information systems and paleoclimate. As I mentioned before, this time period, which is AD uh, 900 to 1600, particularly the latter 400 years of that, AD 1200 to uh, 1600, there's a lot of climate change happening. Um, there's this really, uh, these two major events that are occurring that uh, the first is referred to as the medieval climate anomaly. And this is where much of the world, but particularly the Eastern United States, got a lot warmer uh, and a lot drier in, diff uh, in different ways. Other areas got wetter. It's, there's regional fluctuation. The latter half uh, of the late woodland period, there was what's called the Little Ice Age, in which the, much of the world, if not the entire world, and particularly this area, things got a lot colder. Now, these had different implications. These affected uh, agriculture, the ability to grow corn. It affected um, just general abilities to grow anything in a, in a lot of regions, which this had a lot of social implications historically amongst native communities throughout the United States. So part of what I want to do is to take uh, paleoclimate data, which is proxy data that uh, using uh, tree rings, we've been able to uh, get an idea of what the climate was like for the past 2000 years. And I have, I have measurements for every year across the United States. And it's, I want to take this data and map it through time using the uh, shell sourcing, using the radiocarbon dates to get an idea of the climate and environment that uh, Native communities were dealing with during the late woodland period and in which these exchange relationships were happening. I think that there's some very interesting um, relationships that will come out of that. And I want, to, I want to explore how were people responding to climate change? I think in modern day, the environmental and climate problems that we deal with uh, make this a particularly relevant uh, and interesting part of my project to understand well, how uh, people have always been responding to climate change at different scales and how have, how, how, what social impacts has that had? And I think using maps and paleoclimate data gives me a way of doing that. A little bit of background on the actual material context that I'm going to be working with. As I mentioned, I'm dealing with shell beads. Now, these are uh, shellfish that have been harvested from the coast, the river mouths uh, throughout Virginia and the East Coast. 
and they'd been produced into beads that would have been worn on, in necklaces, worn on clothing. Uh, they would have been adorned on the body in different ways. These are also put into burial context, burial shrouds and um, that type of work. There's other shell involved in this as well. That is a subsistent shell. There's shell that's just consumed. And this is uh, evident at, through, for instance, I've done some work at a site in Southern Virginia where we find a lot of shell where they are making stews and soups or in various ways of uh, eating shellfish. That shell is also uh, important for setting up the baseline against which I want to test. So if I want to get an idea of where the shell beads were coming from, I need to have a baseline for the river systems that are present and understanding how geographic differences are occurring. Another example of shell beads, these are referred to as columella beads. All the beads that I'm showing are beads that are being created from either estuarine or marine species of shellfish. None of the ones that I'm showing are freshwater shell. I suspect that a freshwater shell, if it's being used for a bead, is probably being made locally. And uh, so I'm, I really wanna explore uh, the marine side of things. Part of that is also based on, I mentioned I'm in the Southern Piedmont, the distances that these beads here are having to travel or the shellfish from which, or the, uh, the shell material from which these beads are being made is at the scale of possibly hundreds of miles up rivers. Uh, at a lot of the sites that I'm working at, the closest saltwater source is as much as 150 or 300 miles away. Just a little um, setup for some of my research goals. Uh, my sampling plan, as I mentioned, I, uh, I shell beads and subs uh, subsistent shell, shell that's being consumed for food. I intend to largely sample from a series of sites across uh, the Roanoke River and the, its different drainages, as well as a variety of sites from other rivers in Virginia, so Potomac, York, Rappahannock, et cetera, as well as rivers that connect to the Albemarle Sound in North Carolina and collect subsistence shell that is generally going to be consumed locally by native communities during this time period and use those shells to create a con the control variable. So using these shells that are, that are likely locally sourced and I can be fairly confident are coming from the uh, local river system can give me a baseline for the, uh, the chemical composition of the different river systems. Now, as I mentioned, Chris Shepard, who did a lot of this work already, and has given a really good foundation for this. I'm modeling some of my sampling strategies uh, off of him, such as taking 10 shell from each site. I believe taking 10 shell from each site is gonna give me the ability to eliminate any maybe micro variation that's happening in, in chemistry where one shell uh, may be based on the time or the uh, fluctuations in chemistry of a river system took in a different percentage that maybe isn't uh, representative of that river system as a whole. So the, uh, taking 10 from each site, at least 10 shell from each river system, I think will give me a good baseline to understand the chemistry of all of the re relevant rivers in the project area. I'm then going to collect shell beads from various sites in the Southern Piedmont, uh, particularly emphasizing the palisaded settlements that I mentioned. I think a lot of this, the historical and social processes that I'm, uh, I'm looking at are gonna be uh, very relevant for these palisaded settlements. Another benefit of sampling from the palisaded settlements is that they're largely only occurring after AD 1200. And I wanna look at this latter three, 400 year period where everything is really kick, uh, kicking off socially and historically and it's very eventful. And so palisaded settlements give me a window to achieve that and to ensure that my samples are likely coming from this time period. For radiocarbon dating, I'm gonna use my statistical models to determine how many dates I need for, for each site, how many will give me the uh, precision and chronologies that I want. And then ideally I would like to sample shell material itself. Radiocarbon dating shell can be a little problematic as I found in other research projects that I'm currently working on because of the ways that shell ha, uh, brings in different elements, these processes can actually occur even after shell has been deposited in the ground. And so 
the water as well as the ground, there's different effects of these chemistries on shell that can cause them to have more carbon in them or less carbon that makes these shells appear a lot older than what they actually are. And this is problematic when you're trying to date a site. If you don't get an accurate date, then that can throw off your entire uh, story of how you're, you're understanding the archaeology. Part of what I'm doing now is actually investigating in a separate project whether dating uh, shell can actually be feasible. And so I'm, I'm working with uh, material from different sites that I, th I think uh, will give me a good idea of that, as well as the differences between dating freshwater and saltwater shell. But as far as sampling uh, for radiocarbon dating, ideally, I would be able to date the material that I'm trying to source and get an exact idea of when it's coming from. But generally, I'm going to be uh, taking dates from across these sites from different contexts that I think will give me a good idea of uh, when these sites are being occupied instead of isolated events that maybe won't give me a, uh, be very representative of the chronology. A little bit of an idea into the uh, hypotheses, expected results and models that this uh, project is going to be operating in. The current model or current understanding of exchange throughout this region is what's referred to as down the line exchange or, uh, or otherwise known as a deterioration model in which the source location of whatever material that, or object or artifact class that you're looking at, the closer you are to the source, the more of it you're going to have. Essentially, that just means that it, people are, as they're trading things, they're taking some of it and then moving on the rest uh, to the next stop down the line. So that's the current model. I want to investigate this a little bit. And I think that there's a possibility that if the um, exchange is not happening directly down river systems, if they're maybe not taking shell beads from the communities local uh, isolated to their rivers, then possibly down the line exchange doesn't explain what, what's actually happening. And that I think that can speak a little bit to the social processes that are actually happening it with these shell beads versus just a purely uh, a, a model purely based on consuming some beads, wearing them and getting rid of the ones that you don't like. And I think there's some other things potentially happening there. Part of that is investigating a uh, long distance exchange across river drainages. The larger drainages, there's uh, during the late woodland communities are largely living along rivers. You want to live close to a water source uh, so you don't have to carry water a really long distance. And so this could give me an idea of what's going on between the communities that are living on different river drainages. How far away might they be trading? So uh, is there a possibility that people in the Potomac are interacting with people down in the Roanoke River or the Dan River, which getting an idea of how broad these relationships are can help me test some models and understanding how um, they how those relationships are working, how, what, what are they relying on? What are the shell beads actually doing for people? They're likely not being exchanged and Chris Shepard's work as well as others has backed this up. They're likely not being exchanged just the same way that we, we might trade or exchange items here, that they're meaningless. There's meaning and symbolism and uh, history with these objects that are important that I think are serving purposes for these communities. Um, another model is, and kind of hypothesis here is that the chronology for these sites and maybe the intensification of shell bead exchange, I suspect, is going to map onto the climate data and the bigger climatic events that are happening. Uh, I want to I want to further investigate this and see if it does if it doesn't map onto the climate data, why might that be? What why is what seems to be major climate events that are uh, archaeology is borne out as affecting communities throughout the eastern United States very dramatically. Why is it not affecting pe the people in Virginia in the same way? Some pro preliminary research that I've done on another project has indicated that uh, climate may not be as big of a problem in Virginia, but I want to work this out a little bit and uh, follow along this hypothesis. A little, Speaking a little bit to the significance of my project or what I think the significance is going to be is it's further developing ways to track artifact provenance, provenance being identifying where an object came from, not just where it was found. A lot of this work, as I mentioned, has been done in various ways, and there's this work is still ongoing. And so I want to contribute to the to this work in trying to understand ways that, at least in the area of Virginia and the in areas that have similar river systems or uh, 
aquatic settings to Virginia um, to kind of move this, this research on along. The, the next big thing, which probably should be listed first, is understanding Native American connectivity during this time period. A lot of research has focused on settlement patterns or maybe social organization in the, in the, during this time period, but really we we should have a poor understanding of the relationships that are ha- that exist during this time period in the Southern Piedmont. Other work is a uh, pre- previous work to mine has focused on the Algonquian speaking peoples of the coastal plain, and my work will largely uh, look at what were likely Siouan speakers that but bring in a better understanding of how they were going about their lives, how they were living and interacting during this time period, I think it's going to be very important. And exchange is one of our the biggest windows for archaeology into trying to identify these, uh, these histories. This connects to the fact that shell beads are items that they're powerful, they're very socially significant, historically significant, and using these obje- these shell beads to identify this connectivity, I think is particularly important because I think this is the, I suspect this is the best way for archeologists in uh, in this area to really identify the relationships that uh, exchange is entailing. The next big thing is expanding radiocarbon dating and chronologies in the archeology span of the area. As I alluded to before, a lot of radiocarbon dating has not happened in this region and particularly during this time period. Most of these sites are not very well dated um, which that, that hurts our ability to understand the history and my work and some of the grants that I'm going to attempt to get for this project are going to involve very expansive radiocarbon dating, uh, efforts to really give us an idea of where people were, how long they were there and get an idea of the, the rise and fall of villages and settlements, uh, throughout this period in the centuries that are preceding written records, uh, following European colonization. The next thing, which I've talked about a little bit already, is understanding climate change. We, I, right now, climate change is kind of a big thing in, archae- in archeology span as well as in the broader scientific community, as we're living through a really major um, era or epic of climate change. Now, this is a different, a, a thousand years ago was a very different climatic setting, but it's still people responding to changes in their environment, responding to um, very big processes that are affecting different aspects of their lives. And so I think this work will give a better idea of how people are responding to climate change, how um, possibly impacts of climate refugees. Uh, There's some evidence that people are moving around throughout the Eastern United States during this period and that they're doing so because of climate change in various reasons, um, connected to some of the processes, maize, uh, corn agriculture and other things that are happening. But we having this, this type of work will understand how people are connecting with each other and responding to changes in temperature that are having effects on their day-to-day life. Some other things that I, I want to speak to is just understanding the worlds in the Southern Piedmont. Uh, I'm very interested in the populations and the peoples that were here who have uh, descendants that are living today and that are still still have their ideas, but maybe have lost some of their language or lost some of their histories. And I think understanding the worlds of the peoples that are the ancestors to modern indigenous communities in Virginia and North Carolina, I think is very useful, both for archaeology, as well as I hope for uh, the communities themselves. And so I just want to kind of wrap up with giving a few acknowledgments to the people and organizations that are moving along my uh, project. As I said, this is a very preliminary uh, phase in my research and I'm hoping that this, uh, I can develop these ideas further. And these are a lot of the people and organizations that are helping me do that. So thank you. Uh, So you discussed uh, climate change during the period of the study. Uh, So what data did you use for your uh, climate change assessment? Yeah, so it's um it's data that's coming from NOAA, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. They have this um, individual or group of individuals uh, took tree ring data from across the United States, and they created what's uh, known as or what was originally known as the Palmer Drought Severity Index. And essentially, they were able to use tr- uh, an analysis of tree rings going back about two thousand years, roughly. And they were able to identify soil moisture 
And so that's largely what I am basing uh, my research on is less on the temperature side, though temperature is playing a role and it's more on soil moisture. And so I'm using the most updated version of that data, which is the Palmer, the Palmer modified drought index um, that gives me annual data for every year for the past 2000 years of um, what was soil moisture like across the region. And that's how I'm identifying uh, these climate processes. Uh, so we had another question. Are existing tribes helping with this project by providing inherited bead samples? Not, not at this moment. Uh, most of what I would like to do, so bees that are possessed by um, modern tribes are likely tied to rituals or uh, specific histories or family lineages. And so I would actually largely avoid those uh, in an effort to not damage their cultural material. Uh, laser ablation is inherently destructive, even though it is very minimally destructive. I'm not taking a lot of material, but I am destroying uh, cultural material. And so I want to this is uh, avoid um, things that have specific cultural affiliation. So, for instance, that's why I'm avoiding burial context completely, because I don't want to destroy aspects of goods that were goods or materials that probably had very important symbolic meaning for the individual that was buried in our uh, have very spiritual meaning for these communities. So uh, you, you hit on a, the, the question hits on a very good thing. Uh, important thing though, is I do want to increase uh, engagement with indigenous communities, which I haven't done a lot of yet. And so I do want to explore avenues for working with descendant communities and modern indigenous communities to see what ways are, is my work relevant for them? What histories and um, information can they provide me in trying to understand the context of these beads. Uh, I'd like to ask, have you run across any particularly surprising findings so far in your work? Yeah, the, the biggest, the, the most surprising finding so far was actually the climate data. Um, a lot of uh, work that I'm actually doing with my advisor right now is very oriented towards um, trying to understand climate change. And a lot of archeologists have explored this. And so across the United States, particularly the Eastern United States, there's major changes that are happening to climate change. So they've been able to, to using uh, precursors to the, the climate data that I'm using, they were able to show that very large settlements, uh, Cahokia, which was the uh, first city in North America uh, or in the United, continental United States, the, um, the fall or decline of these of different civilizations, of different uh, traditions was tied to major climate change that was things were getting a lot uh, drier, possibly a lot uh, warmer or colder. And so this was causing problems for every, everyone largely. But then some of my preliminary climate data has actually shown that these things that were affecting almost everybody else were not happening in Virginia. Um, I, I don't have some major conclusions on that. There's been some other work done on it. I, I suspect it possibly has something to do with uh, the Appalachian and Blue Ridge Mountains and maybe that in uh, possibly ocean currents. Um, it, I, I don't fully understand it right now, but that's been the, the most surprising thing so far is that uh, whatever's happening in Virginia is possibly not tied to climate. And instead the relationship to climate might be climate refugees that are coming from outside areas, recognizing that the areas that are in modern, that are what is now modern day Virginia are doing a lot better. They're able to grow their crops. They're able to, they're, there's plenty of access to water that they're not uh, under the same environmental stresses that seem to be impacting everyone else. Okay, so we had the question, have you started to look at historical alliances and enemy nations to understand potential trading partners? Absolutely. The, the, the biggest one here is actually relationships between uh, what was the Powhatan chiefdom and Siouan speakers in the Piedmont. My advisors have done work on uh, and previous advisors have done work on this in uh, more a little bit north of my region in understanding how uh, the Powhatan chiefdom and communities were relating to monikins in the Piedmont. And I've started to explore some of that, some of what the English colonists were reporting, as well as what um, maybe some in, uh, later in, uh, indigenous members were talking about. I've thought about the Iroquois far, way far to the north and maybe implications that that 
actually is having for Virginia. But yes, I've, I've been um, starting to dive into trying to understand who at the latter period of this, when Europeans get here and start documenting things, who do we know seems to be related to each other? Some of that history is actually very complex for the Piedmont and trying to understand uh, words that maybe an English colonist used that didn't really mean what they thought they meant that might have referred to a political organization or whether they referred to a specific people and trying to work out some of that information uh, is going to be part of this project as well. Okay, and uh, if your experiments confirm that the carbon dating is overestimating the age at these sites, how do you plan to adjust for that in your data analysis? One of the, the benefits of a uh, radiocarbon dating um, shell is they, people, uh, prior scholars have uh, recognized the Cor uh, the corrections can be made. And so there's actually a database for marine shell that I can apply a numeric correction to a date and correct for whatever the time frame is. So there has been work in understanding historically or geographically the, cha the changes and possible effects that salt water and different levels of salinity might have on what ra radiocarbon dates might be yielded. And so that uh, I'll be accessing, if any of the radiocarbon dating I do on um, shell, I'll be using those that database to make the corrections. Freshwater shell is a little bit more difficult. You have to uh, find local corrections. So I'll have to uh, work with uh, likely local geologists that have uh, will have a better understanding of that in trying to understand when and where do I need to make a freshwater correction. As far as non-shell material that I'll be dating, any anomalous dates, if I have reason to, I will get rid of. If I'm not getting results that I'm expecting, my first instinct is going to be to try to explain, well, why is that happening? And is it actually a problem or is it just there's something else going on that I didn't recognize uh, historically? Any anomalous dates that have different problems, there can be contamination of a sample that aren't, that aren't yielding what it's supposed to be. I can get rid of those dates and not include them and just uh, I would just have to argue and justify of why I got rid of that and didn't include it. Uh, we did have the question here. Uh, what was the date range of Little Ice Age? That's a little uh, back and forth. So the general date range for it is that it starts in 80, 1300, 80, 1400. Some previous work in Virginia in the Chesapeake Bay has actually shown that it happened a lot earlier in Virginia. Um, so potentially, if I'm remembering correctly, um, and then the name of this work is, uh, uh, I think it's William Cronin. I'm, I might be um, misremembering that name, but uh, has shown that the peak of the Little Ice Age may have actually been occurring as early as 900 or 1000 AD. Um, but the as far as how long it lasts, there's been some argument that the Little Ice Age lasts all the way into the 1800s. So um, the setting that the European colonists uh, arrive into is potentially in the middle of the Little Ice Age. Now that's speaking of temperature, uh, as far as soil moisture, the soil moisture doesn't map uh, exactly onto the, the temperature data. Um, so my climate data has re revealed there's uh, some valleys in soil moisture and big periods of dryness that happen in the middle of the 14th century AD as well as uh, a little bit in the 13th century, and then a really big problem uh, as far as uh, moisture goes, uh, happens in the late 16th century, right before Europeans arrive in Virginia. Uh, so are you looking at any isotope data or just elemental percentages? For the sourcing, I'm largely gonna be looking at uh, just general composition. There's been some evidence that stable isotope is a really good way of um, doing this work and some other scholars have pursued that. I, because I'm, I'm using uh, Chris Shepard, Evan Peacock and some others working with the Missouri University uh, Research Reactor, uh, laser ablation to me and kind of just general elemental chemistry or elemental composition seems to be the way of uh, my best path forward for what I wanna do. The, I will do, I will say I will do some stable isotope uh, for my radiocarbon dating in terms of using stable isotope to confirm uh, non-shell materials that I date. How do we follow the progress of your work? Yeah, so um, I would like to, in the future, potentially give an updated uh, Lunch Break Science talk. 
I will likely be presenting some more of this with um, through William and Mary Anthropology and publishing as much of my work as I can. So uh, following various archaeological journals that uh, such as American Antiquity, Journal of Middle Atlantic Archaeology, um, I would as, as I make progress on this, I'd like to be publishing my results uh, there. And then I do plan to make uh, at the conclusion of my project, I do plan to make all of my data uh, publicly available through the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, uh, possibly the uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Research Laboratories of Archaeology and whatever sources, uh, whatever other sources that I can possibly work out, as well as potentially the uh, Science Museum of Virginia. All right, great. And looks like that's probably it. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and bring it to a close for today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And thanks to Mr. John Henshaw, a PhD student from William and Mary, for helping us discover more about our world. Uh, please join us on Wednesday, December 15th at noon, or inland and coastal waters are changing color. So what? Uh, presented by Dina Leach, Associate Professor of Biology at Longwood University. Uh, so that's going to be a really, really good one if you're interested at all in what's going on on our inland and coastal waterways. Uh, so you can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all for being here today. <music>